Sjogren's has traditionally been thought to most commonly occur in adults. However, it is more common among children than first thought. One major difference between adults and children with Sjogren's are the major clinical presenting features. Today, we will explore these differences with leading rheumatologists and families of children with Sjogren's. Here is what we learned. A lot of people, even in pediatric rheumatology, don't necessarily think much about Sjogren's syndrome because it's often thought not to be a, a condition that occurs in children. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of these kids will come with joint pain and they'll come with a, a positive ANA test or something that prompts looking into it further. And then if you have a heightened uh, awareness of this condition, so I kind of treat every kid that comes into my clinic as this could be Sjogren's mm -hmm. because it comes in sort of all shapes and sizes. So, so kids don't usually come to us with profound dry eyes and dry mouth, mm -hmm. or they may have that, but that's not what brings them to the doctor. Mm -hmm. The most common thing for kids with Sjogren's syndrome is recurrent episodes of swelling and inflammation in their parotid glands, the major salivary glands. And it kind of mimics mumps in some ways, uh, although we don't see a lot of mumps, mm -hmm. but a lot of times people think it's an infection, they give them antibiotics, it goes away after a week, but then it happens again, and eventually they don't get antibiotics and it still goes away after a week. And so then someone realizes, oh, this is a recurrent theme of inflammation. And so that's the most common, and, and it makes sense it's the target organ, right? Mm -hmm. It's the saliva producing glands getting inflamed. Um, but that only accounts for maybe 60% of kids with Sjogren's syndrome. And so it's the other 40% that are a little more confusing. And I, I kind of say that those are the ones that, that are diagnosed by accident. Children don't often present with the predominant symptoms of dry mouth and dry eye. So identifying when children started and diagnosing them can be a challenge. I think it's really hard to know when it starts, mm -hmm. uh, because the I think the recurrent parotitis is usually you know, swelling and painful, and so those kids come to medical attention relatively quickly because you know they have obvious symptoms. But it's the other kids where it's this slow, progressive onset, where I, I think it's hard to look back. A lot of these kids have very little saliva and, and very dry mouths but they don't really notice. And I don't know if it's because the quality of their saliva is different mm -hmm. or if it's because they never knew it any other way. And, uh, and so I think that makes it a little more complicated to figure out exactly what the differences are. The challenge with getting a prompt or proper diagnosis of Sjogren's is that the symptoms in children mimic many other conditions. This causes a slow diagnosis time and often takes many visits to numerous types of physicians. Grace was uh, just challenged with fevers for a long time, a lot of fatigue, and a lot of pain, just general pain that didn't add up because she was so energetic and full of life. And then it just seemed like something knocked her off her feet. And we began searching for answers, and um, it was a slow process. But I say it's slow, but in comparison to other people, we got a diagnosis within a year, which is really not very common. Mm -hmm. He had uh, multiple episodes of parotid gland swelling, fevers, lethargy, uh, sleeping a lot, um, some weight gain, but mainly a lot of swelling from the parotid gland implications. And we went to our primary care doctor, We've been, we were referred to ENT, uh, back and forth about four times. Um, finally, a decision was made by ENT to possibly do surgery to find a, the etiology of what was going on. It was still unknown. And the primary care physician was not happy with that response, so we decided to do additional lab work. So we started the rheumatology workup. Getting referred to a pediatric rheumatologist is the best way to get a prompt diagnosis and proper treatment. Usually by the time someone's referring a kid to a pediatric rheumatologist, they've had a lot of testing for a lot of things because we're not usually at the top of the list of, you know, oh, my right. kids, you know, got a fever, probably we need to go to the rheumatologist. One area that both children and adults with Sjogren's have in common is how they feel after getting a formal diagnosis. You feel a sense of relief when you can call it something, but at the same time when I went out to the internet and looked for answers, all I could find was information on women in their middle age being diagnosed with Sjogren's and their primary symptoms being dry eye and dry mouth. And that didn't parallel what I was observing at home with Grace. Explaining Sjogren's to a child and their parents can be tough. Yeah, I think 
the the most difficult thing for them to sort of come to terms with is the chronicity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think just having, you know, I, I have at least one patient who just has profound fatigue and has said at times, like, is this just the way it's going to be? Because if I need to just accept this and move on, you know, I'll do that, but, but let me know. And, and that's very tough. As with all patients with Sjogren's, having family and friends truly understand the impact and the severity of the disease is an ongoing struggle. I think it's really difficult for friends and family to understand what Sjogren's is because I think it's difficult for a patient to truly understand all the ways Sjogren's impacts them because it's so unpredictable. One of my biggest challenges with talking with other family members about my child's diagnosis is that it's not fixed by a nap or a good night's sleep or changing her diet and why I have to help her balance her time and how she spends her time. So invitations for sleepovers, you know if your kid is not getting the proper amount of sleep, then we know a flare is right around the corner. For children and young teenagers, learning to live with and manage a chronic disease like Sjogren's can be an everyday challenge. But on a day-to-day -day basis, waking up is hard because of the stiffness I feel in the morning. Uh, class can be made hard because of the fatigue. Uh, it's basically a cloudy feeling, and even though you're taking in information or hearing it, it doesn't really register immediately, and you don't even realize it till you're back at home and you're looking at your homework and you're like, did we learn this? As any parent with a child with a health condition knows, the future is always their concern. From how their child will be perceived, will they be able to achieve their dreams, and how will their disease and the treatments affect their child over a lifetime? I don't know what the future holds for Grace. I know that Grace will be able to do anything she decides she wants to do. She may have to work at it harder than others, but I know if she commits, decides, and works at it, she can get it done. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think about her future. My concern for the future is the use of medications. I mean, he's on a pretty antiquated uh, regimen of Plaquenil, and he's been on it since he's seven. So we know we have a lot of time before there's issues of toxicity, but we do worry he does get uh, every six months the annual eye screening from a specialist. Um, I worry about his teeth. I worry about his joints. I worry just about uh, other systematic manifestations of the lungs or other organs involved. I worry what that is going to look like for him in the future. We still have a lot to learn about pediatric Sjogren's, and that is why the Sjogren's Foundation is working with parents and pediatric rheumatologists to learn more about this disease. In addition to our pediatric support group and our awareness materials on children with Sjogren's, the foundation has also awarded research grants in pediatric Sjogren's to help further our knowledge and understanding in this area. To learn more about pediatric Sjogren's and see our educational materials, as well as find information about our pediatric support group, please visit Sjogren's.org. Thank you for joining us today on Exploring Sjogren's.